All right, welcome everybody um, to another video in our puzzle solving series. Uh, in this video, I'll be solving approximately five high rated exercises on chess.com. The rating range for this video's puzzles will be 2850 to 3100. Uh, I'll be talking you through step by step my solutions and walking you through my thought process. Uh, this is a pretty in demand series. People really like to see how I approach more difficult exercises, how I calculate longer variations and break down a uh, complex position. So hopefully I'll make this accessible even uh, to those of you watching who are newer to chess. I'll do my best to break everything down for you. And obviously I might make mistakes myself and we'll try to extract as much instructive value from each exercise as possible. I'm live streaming currently on Twitch. For those watching on YouTube, I apologize for the long delay in putting out a video. It's been almost a month. I have been uh, very busy with commentary and other personal projects. And also I've been a little bit burnt out. So I've been taking uh, something like a creative break just to make sure that uh, the next set of videos that I put out is at the same level uh, of instructive value. I have high standards for myself and I don't just want to put something out uh, just for the sake of it. So I apologize for that. Hopefully the uploads will be a little bit more regular from now on. All right. So without further ado, for those watching on YouTube, I will be involving Twitch chat in uh, the solution. So if I reference chat or I reference a move that somebody suggested, it's because I'm currently streaming on Twitch as I'm recording uh, this video. Okay, let's jump in. And <laughs> somebody's saying E4. It's like when the teacher asks, okay, I need like five volunteers and everybody raises their hand. All right, go, go run five laps around the school. Okay, here we go. So generally, Exercises in this rating range are a pretty mixed bag. You should not fall into the trap of thinking that each of them is going to be necessarily a 30 move variation. Some of them are going to be very short. So there's different types of difficulty in chess. Of course, there might be longer variations, but there also might be exercises, for example, in which you have to decide between two very tempting moves. And that is where the difficulty lies. It's not necessarily in long calculation. Okay, so first exercise. Looks like a simple position, material is equal. First thing that jumps out at me, of course, is the alignment of the queen and the rook. Uh, the queen is vulnerable, the rook on e8 is undefended. So immediately, uh, the move rook e1 comes to mind. But there's two rooks that we can put on e1. So tentatively, this seems like an exercise in comparison. We have to compare rook de1 and rook fe1. And we have to be very concrete about it. There, Clearly, one of the moves falls into some sort of counter tactic or counter blow. We have to figure out which one it is. Okay, so from a logical perspective, the safer move seems to be rook D uh, to E1 because it leaves the other rook very, very safely positioned on F1. But I'm saying this without having spotted a particular tactic. Now that I look at it more carefully, I think I see what the problem is with rook Fe1. The problem with the rook, rook Fe1 is that Black cannot move their queen any, anywhere. Queen f6, queen f5, all of the squares are covered. We're simply going to win the rook. But if you look carefully, the rook on d1 is ultra vulnerable. And the vulnerability can be exploited in a couple of ways. Black has the very nasty move queen to h5 after rook fe1. But queen h5 can actually be met with uh, queen d4 check, defending the rook on d1 and simultaneously checking the king. And in that line, if the king steps back to f8, there is a checkmate on h8, queen d4 to h8. But there is a similar problem after rook f1. Black has this brilliant move, rook to d7, which can be very hard to spot, rook to d7. And the issue is that if you simply take the rook, then black takes on e1, and material is equal. And after rook f1, rook d7, if you take the queen, then obviously black is going to take the rook on d1 first. That's a check. The king is going to step aside, and black is going to capture the other rook. And black is going to have two rooks for a queen, which is approximate material equality. And white's advantage is in serious question. I think rook de1 avoids all of these issues because black has absolutely no equivalent. There's no way to exploit the rook on f1. Let's go ahead and play rook de1. So the takeaway from this relatively simple exercise is process of comparison. I used general intuitive logic uh, to reach a tentative conclusion. And then I looked more specifically and asked myself, how can black exploit uh, the vulnerable nature of the rook on d1? And once that question is asked, you have a chance at finding uh, the, the very powerful counter blow rook to d7. 
If people in Twitch chat have questions, please send them over before I start the next exercise. This might be helpful also to people watching on YouTube. And for those watching on YouTube, you should be pausing the video uh, after each exercise is displayed and, and taking a stab at it yourself. That's the best way to it, it extract instructive value from, from the video. Okay, onwards we go. Next exercise. Okay, so we have an end game. White is down a piece. We have two minor pieces. Black is up a bishop. But first thing that jumps out at me is that Black's queen side is undeveloped. So there is this very obvious candidate move, rook d8 check. But when you're solving these more complex exercises, you have to remember that it's generally not, you generally can't solve it in two seconds. So even if your brain is screaming a particular move, you have to force yourself to calculate a little bit further because sometimes that is where the difficulty lies. You have to resist the temptation or you have to come up with an actual follow-up because rook d8 is not checkmate. Black can block with the bishop, bishop f8. And in that position, the classic move is bishop to h6. You might be familiar with this mating pattern. But the issue with bishop h6 is black has this move bishop to b7, connecting the rook and the bishop. So rook takes f8 is not checkmate. Now, I see that we can win the piece back. So we can go rook d8 check, bishop f8, bishop h6, bishop b7. We can throw in knight e7 check, forcing the king to the side, and then we can capture twice uh, the bishop on f8, and material is equal. But there the position looks equal, and we're trying to win. So we go back to the last moment at which we had a choice. After rook d8, bishop f8, let's pause for a second, and let's make sure that we're not missing any alternatives uh, to bishop h6. I'm going to take a moment in silence and see if, we, if, I, if I can figure something out. So rook d8, bishop f8 is the first critical position. Aha, uh -huh, I got it. So the first thing I did was revisit bishop h6 for a second. Because if bishop h6 works out, it's likely to lead to checkmate. You want to start with the options that have the most promise. And after rook d8, bishop f8, bishop h6, bishop b7, the longer the distance between two different pieces, the higher the likelihood of some sort of interference tactics. That's where you put a piece in between one of your pieces and one of your opponent's pieces, or sometimes two of your opponent's pieces. And once I pose that question, you should immediately spot the move. Knight c6 drops into b8, interfering with the connection of the rooks. And that's it. Black has no way to defend the bishop on f8. Black can only stave it off with rook takes b8. Rook takes b8, and black is checkmated. Okay, so I think the solution is check. Bishop h6, bishop b7, and now the critical move. Not knight e7 check, but knight b8. Rook takes b8, rook takes b8. Bishop c8, rook takes c8, and rook takes f8 uh, is going to be checkmate. Now, you might ask, well, what is the process of finding the move knight b8? Well, the process is as follows. You should see rook d8, bishop h6, because this is a very common pattern. Then you should pause and you should revisit your assumptions. It's very easy to assume in this position that knight e7 check is the only serious move. King h8, rook takes f8. But you have to unwind, unspool the tape, pause in critical positions, and make sure that you're not falling into assuming that the move is forced. Also, interference tactics are extremely important. Uh, they occur very, very often. And a good rule of thumb is to remember that the further the distance between two pieces, the higher the likelihood of a particular interference tactic. Here is a simple example from one of my games that I've shown uh, many, many times before on stream and on YouTube. Just a moment. Let me switch scenes. Hopefully, this will hammer home. This is maybe not the best example, but hopefully, this will hammer home the theme. OK, so here is a game that I played in 2008. We're in an end game. My rating was 2300. And in this position, I played the move rook takes f2. I grabbed the pawn. Pause the video and see if you can figure out my opponent's powerful response. White to play. So you should notice that there is a very large distance between the two rooks. That should give you a hint that it's some sort of interference tactic. So you might say, ah, it's bishop f7. But that simply blunders the bishop. No. Bishop f3 is correct. The rooks are disjointed. The rook on f2 is trapped. And after g takes f3, king takes f2, white simply wins the exchange. Also very important is that the e4 square is protected by uh, the other rook. OK? So a simple example of an interference tactic. That's how you find knight b8. Onwards we go. 
unless there are any questions. Okay, next puzzle. Okay, so finally we have one with queens on the board. It seems that both kings are in a very vulnerable spot. I'm also noticing, obviously, that there is a standoff between the queens. I see that there is the move bishop f4 check, which is the first move that comes to mind. So this seems to be a, a pure calculation exercise. So let's start calculating. Well, c takes b2 doesn't make much sense to me because it helps the king hide underneath the pawn with king b1. So we should probably start with bishop f4 check. Okay, white has to move the king to b1. And now it seems reasonable to grab the knight with uh, the queen. Queen takes d4. So it seems that white is probably going to respond with queen takes h7 check. Where is our king going to go in that situation? Well, likely it's going to go toward the center, king to e6. And the question is, does white have any kind of attacking chances in that resulting position? Because if not, then we're simply up a piece. Well, I'm noticing that white has rookie one check in that position. But because of this very well-placed pawn on f6, we can block that check with our bishop. We can play bishop e5, and I think white runs out of checks. Um, so is it as simple as that? Bishop f4 check, king b1, queen takes d4, queen takes h7 check, king to e6. And I'm really not seeing much in the way of serious attacking chances for white, despite the fact that our king is stuck in the center. It's surrounded by a lot of friendly friendly forces, and I don't think white has enough firepower to get anything started. Hmm. Okay, so bishop f4 check. Let's go for it. Yeah, knight takes d4, I think, is seriously inferior, and I'll show why after we complete the exercise. Check. And now your instinct should be often to run into the center, not away from the center, because king e8 is a much riskier move. Why is king e8 a riskier move? First of all, it... it uncoordinates the rooks, which is a really, really bad idea when you're getting attacked. Second of all, it opens up the possibility for checks along this diagonal, queen h5 and queen g6. And third of all, there is an idea connected with the move rook d1 and queen to d7 checkmate. But actually, I'm noticing that after king e6, we have to test the move rook to d1. That is a very scary move, rook to d1, because if our queen moves away from d4, then white has a potential mating combination with queen d7 check and queen d5 mate. So do we have a response after king e6, rook d1? Let's take a moment and think about that. Yeah, of course we can push c2, but then white will simply take the pawn of the queen, and it seems like white has a very, very strong attack in that situation. Tapions, what is your question? You're spamming the chat right now. If you have a question, please go ahead and ask it. So king e6, rook d1. Again, we have an interference move. I think there is the move bishop to d2, bishop to d2, simply cutting off the supply. And in that situation, after king e6, rook d1, bishop d2, white can give a check with the other rook, rook h to e1 check. And who can spot the defensive resource in that position after rook h e1 check? Yeah, we can use the knight. We can block on e5 with the knight. There are two pieces. There are two pieces that can block on e5 the bishop and the knight. So in that situation, we use the bishop to block the d-file, and we use the knight to block the e-file. I think it's king e6. Yep, rook d1, bishop d2, rook h e1 check, and knight e5. The attack has fizzled out, and we win the game. So this is what I would call a... I actually don't have a name for this type of exercise, but I really like these types of exercises because they're realistic, right? It's not like you have to find a tactic. You basically have to beat back the attack with a series of very accurate moves, okay? Bishop f4 check is very easy. This is the easy part. The next hurdle to cross is to understand why knight takes d4 is bad. Well, knight takes d4 is a bad move a priori because it doesn't come with tempo, and it gives white a wide variety of different options. For example, white can even play the move bc, according to the engine, simply bc. And the knight on d4 is unstable. And obviously, if you move the knight back, I mean, now you're giving up the bishop. It, you don't have to calculate this deeply to understand that queen takes d4 is just a better move, because this move comes with tempo. It essentially forces white's hand. It forces white to take on h7. King e6. Now, king e8, rook d1 is an inferior version. Bishop d2, the rooks are not coordinated. White's got more checks along this diagonal, so I rejected this largely intuitively. King e6, 
rook d1, and now very important move, bishop d2. Now, I missed rook d1 when I was solving the exercise initially. I didn't see this move uh, when I was playing bishop f4 check. That's a uh, an issue. I should have seen it. And the reason I missed it is because I got fixated on the fact that white has this check. I assumed that this move was forced, and this is very, very easy to defend against. You just play bishop e5. But rook d1 is a very tricky move, because if you move the queen, then you get checkmated in two moves. Again, interference, and then using our other minor piece to interfere with the other rook. Simply a matter of eliminating the incorrect options and going for uh, the most natural options. Why can't white trade queens? Because white is down a minor piece. White is simply down a piece. You have two pieces, white has one. You have a technically winning endgame. Okay. Uh, what if you just run the king? Another question from Crumbler. What if you just run the king? Where? Here, if you run the king, I mean, it's terrifying. Look at the king. There's queen d7 check. The computer gives even simply b take c3, uh, removing the defender of the bishop. This is just a terrifying move to play. Now, king d5 just, again, you should reject this move intuitively. Okay, on we go. Next exercise, white to play. Okay, so what's the material count? We have two rooks for a queen and two minor pieces, which essentially tells me that most likely we have to go for checkmate because we're unlikely to win all of black's material back. So the obvious move is rook e8 check, but immediately I'm spotting that the king has only one escape square. I'm also noticing that our king is extremely safe, which grants us a potential possibility to play a quieter move. So the first move that comes to my mind is actually rook a to d1 in order to cover the only escape square for the king and to set up rook e8 mate. Rook a d1 also threatens a mate of its own, rook d8. And if black tries bishop e7, then obviously there's going to just be rook takes e7 and mate is unstoppable. If after rook a d1, black plays bishop to d7, removing the guard, rook e8 check, bishop takes e8 and rook d8 is a simple construction. Does black have any defense after rook ad1 is the question. Okay, there's no bishop d3. There's no interference along the d-file. Black can't defend the square with a queen. Bishop d6 doesn't do anything. I think simply rook ad1 is made. This is a simple exercise. But a lot of you would automatically give this check and then start thinking. right? So you think it's very simple because I paused at the right moment, and then it becomes easy. But in reality, I think a lot of people solving this would throw in this check without thinking. And only after king d7, they'd realize, wait a second, I don't have a clear continuation of the attack. Here, here, and the, and the puzzle is solved. Why is rook e8 check bad? Because you're not winning enough material back. Rook takes f8, the position is equal according to the engine, because you do have a long-term attack against the king, but black has extra material, so the position is unclear. Definitely white is not winning, though. Okay? Okay, on we go. Wow, looks like a complicated exercise where both kings are in a very vulnerable situation. OK, so the material count is approximately equal. I guess white is up two pawns, but that doesn't seem too important. Black's threat is rook takes g2 check, which tells me that most likely we have to play with tempo, which tells me that most likely the first move is going to be knight to b5 check. That is kind of begging to be played. So after knight b5 check, black has a couple of options with their king. Um, there's king takes c6. But that seems completely brazen. I feel like we can just go for mate there with a move like rook ac1. Let's put that aside. After knight b5 check, if king to b8, then we have a mating sequence with queen b6 check. Good. But after knight b5 check, there is also the move king to c8. And after king to c8, it doesn't appear that we have any effective checks other than to go back to a7 and make a draw. OK, so let's keep thinking for a second here. Maybe there's a hidden resource that we're missing. So let's pause for a moment after knight to b5 check king c8. Let's start there. Is there anything tactical in that position? Knight b5, king c8. There's no check on f5 because of the bishop. OK, there is the possibility of rook takes e5 in some situation. That should be noted. Rook takes e5 might be very powerful. In fact, what if we play rook takes e5 here? What if we play rook takes e5 here? Let's consider the capture. Because if black plays queen takes e5, then I think we have queen takes f7 check. And it appears that the king is going to be checkmated there. King b6, we have queen to b7. 
Yeah, and then the other knight can jump into c4. That's just mate. But the problem after rook takes e5 seems to be that black has the intermezzo rook takes g2 check. And again, this is where I think the power, the negative power of assumptions comes in. Because you look at the position after rook takes e5, rook takes g2 check. And most people just assume that you have to give up the queen for the rook. You have to play queen takes g2. And then black plays rook takes g2, recaptures the rook on e5, and black is completely winning. But after rook takes e5, rook takes g2 check, if you pause for a second, I think the hidden resource is simply king to h1 in that position. And amazingly, because of the placement on the rook on g2, it essentially shelters white's king from any effective checks. Rook takes e5, rook takes g2, king h1. Queen h4 check does not exist because we're covering that square. If black takes the queen, then we take black's queen, and we're simply up a piece, let's not forget. Rook takes e5 captures a minor piece, so in that position we're just up a minor piece, and we're attacking the king. And after rook takes e5, rook takes g2, king h1, if black plays queen takes e5, then nothing has changed. We can still play queen takes f7 with a mating attack. So rook e5, rook g2, king h1. Rook h2 check, we can take with the queen, and we're safe. Rook g1 check, we can just play rook takes g1. I think that's it. Now you might ask, why not start with knight b5, king c8, and then play rook takes e5? Well, that's counterproductive, because already there, black can play queen takes e5, and queen takes f7 is no longer a check. So I think the move is actually rook takes e5. Bang. Now not king f1, because then black can capture the queen with a check. King to h1. Rook takes e7, and we win. That was a great exercise. Let's pull up an analysis board for a second. So what was the process of finding the move? Well, first thing you should notice is that both kings are very vulnerable. This tells you that there's probably something very tactical, very concrete that has to be found. Knight b5 check is what most people would play. So the first hurdle was to spot the defense king c8, not to assume that black has to take the pawn. And yes, here white's attack is going to be decisive. Although it's actually not so easy if you, lo if you look with the engine. It's apparently the line is takes, takes an a4, which is hard to see. But one way or the other, white gets to black's king. The problem, though, is king c8. And we run out of checks. So I spent a moment in this position just looking for crazy moves. And then I came back to the start and I said, okay, well, what else could it possibly be? We haven't looked at the captures. We only looked at the check. We haven't looked at the only meaningful capture. You have to force yourself to look at it. The hardest part of this exercise is not assuming that you have to play queen takes g2. Obviously, this move loses. Takes, 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 and white's... Not only is white down a queen, but white's losing, like, everything else here. The moment you pause here, you have a chance of spotting king h1. Because slowly you start to see, wait a second, the king is wide open, but black doesn't actually have any checks. Then you see rook f2, rook e7, you're up a piece. You have to spot that queen f7 leads to a mating attack. But that's not very hard. Because, I mean, even, even knight c4 check wins the game. Even simply winning the queen is enough. Because once you capture the queen, black has no follow-up to the attack. And, uh, and the game is over. Okay. Very nice exercise. Let's do one or two more. I'm not sure how long I've been going, but we can do one or two more. Okay, this one's very easy. This is just made in three. And this is a pattern that everybody should be familiar with. Um, it's queen takes h7, king f8, and now very simple logic. e7 is the only escape square. The rook on e1 is already x-raying that square. So simply we have to choose the right check. Queen h7, king f8, not knight g6. Very common mistake, forgetting that when a pawn moves away from a square, that square is now an open escape square. f takes g6, queen h8, king f7. But instead... Instead, after queen takes h7, king f8, we have the move knight d7 check, okay? Because this keeps the pawns in their initial positions. Queen takes d7, queen h8, mate. Very easy. And when you know patterns like this, you don't have to waste any time calculating queen h8, king e7, knight takes c6, right? This is all about knowledge of mating patterns. If you're a newer player, you're probably going to get attracted to this possibility, thinking that, wow, you know, I'm winning all of black's pieces. This is a double check. But after king d6, it's a complete mess. It's a total complete mess because black is also threatening mate in one. All right, so a lot of the time, knowledge of mating pattern allows you to avoid the wrong path. And it actually saves you a lot of time because you don't spend time calculating the wrong line. 
I didn't even have to evaluate queen h8 because I saw that this was mate. OK, easy exercise. Let's move on. Number seven. OK, so we have a situation where material is equal. The knight on c7 seems to be stranded. Our king is a little bit vulnerable. And obviously, the rook on h8 is hanging. So we can't, or seemingly, we can't take the knight because of queen takes h8. So my first inclination would be to somehow guard the rook. The only way to guard the rook seems to be to put a piece on f6. So that leads us to knight f6 and queen f6. But I'm also noticing that there is a pin against the b file, against the b pawn. So queen f6 runs into queen takes c5 at the very least. And we can play king takes c7 there, but clearly we're not better in that position. White is an attack. So by process of elimination, I'm thinking that it's knight f6. How can white try to save the knight in that situation? Well, knight f6, first of all, white can try to put pressure on the knight on f6 with the move rook f1. But there, I'm thinking we can just play rook f8, reinforcing the knight and renewing the threat against white's knight on c7. So knight f6, what about knight a6? No, we just play knight takes a6. We just play knight takes a6. So I'm not seeing a way for white to save the knight after we play knight f6. Um, maybe white can play queen f4, but that seems like a very flimsy move. We could always just play rook h8 to f8, and the threat against the knight is renewed. Yeah, I think knight f6. OK, rook f1. White tries to counterattack our knight, and I think the move is just rook f8. Very important to keep this knight on c5. If you drop the knight to d7, you are allowing white to evacuate via a6. And when you're trying to trap a piece, you have to be aware of all the potential escape routes and make sure that all of them are covered. I think the move is just rook f8. Yeah, knight b5. And I think we can just take the knight. Notice that it would be a very bad idea to take the bishop first. You know, these subtleties are super, super important. If you try to take the bishop first, then you're allowing an intermediate check on d6. Yeah, you're allowing knight d6 check. And after king c7, I think there is the move knight f5. The knight bounces around, attacking your pieces, and finally white, white will be able to capture on d3. Just take the knight. Yeah, so these types of move order questions always come down to spotting some sort of intermezzo. Very, very important. Actually, there was a good uh, illustration of this in uh, the St. Louis Rapid Tournament, where you have to compare two different move orders. Oops, sorry. Let me pull up that game really quickly. I'm going to go on starting soon for just a second. This is very on theme. Just a moment. I'm going to pull up the game. OK, there we go. So just a second. All right. So this was Sevian versus Geary. And this game got a lot of publicity because Sevian flagged in a like an end game that he could not possibly lose. But earlier in the game, he put together a very instructive sequence of moves. So it's white to play. This was obviously a Berlin endgame. What to do? White is down a pawn. It looks like white is at a dead end. And out of the blue, Sevian finds a very, very powerful sequence of moves. And I encourage you to pause and, and try to come up with it. It's actually not easy at all. It's not made in one, because black has the b7 square for the king. So what comes to mind here? as you look at this for, for a bit of time. What seems natural, where do we begin? Yeah, so obviously, the most natural move to me is rook d8 check. This has to be tested. King b7, and you might say, aha, uh -huh, well, I can actually reestablish material equality. I can play rook takes a8, king takes a8, bishop takes c7. But not only is this kind of underwhelming, but also you should notice that the knight on f3 is hanging. Black can just play bishop takes f3. So the rule is always to come back to the last moment at which you had a choice. As you're calculating, you don't reject the initial move, rook d8 check. You reject the most recent move, right? The move that fails is bishop takes c7. But maybe there's something else in this position that has to be looked at. Well, you look at it for a second. You say, ah, maybe I can give this other check on d8. And maybe I can try to somehow make it very difficult for black to get uh, his kingside pieces out. So rook d8 check comes to mind. So black goes king b7. And looking at this more carefully, you should notice that black wants to play bishop e7 because the knight on g6 guards the rook. So what move comes to mind to try to prevent bishop e7 from happening? 
Well, to prevent it from happening, you have to remove the knight from g6. That would make it impossible for black to move the bishop. So we come up with the move knight e5. And everything seems fantastic. If black plays knight e5, we play bishop e5, and we've reached kind of a dream position where it's almost impossible for black to move. The rook on d8 is completely dominating the game. It's great. But there is a flaw. After knight e5, if you pause for a second, you say, does black have to take on e5? Well, what is the answer? Does black have to play knight takes e5? Well, obvious, well not obvious that, it, that, that the answer is no. Not obvious at all. But black has this very powerful resource, bishop e7, anyway. And the problem is white can't do everything at once. Rook h8, knight h8, and black is fine. And if you play knight takes g6 and say, ah, I can get two pieces for a rook. Well, the problem is rook takes d8, knight takes e7. Now the knight on e7 is trapped. Its only evacuation square is g6, and black can get, take that away with the move bishop e8. Also, the rook is infiltrating to d2, which is really nasty. White's position is terrible. So we're very close, but here is where the move order becomes crucial. What is the correct move order of this sequence? How do we fix this issue? How do we debug? How do we de At which point can we interchange the moves? And it's not necessarily here. I'm just rewinding to the start so that you can try to evaluate this in your head. Yeah, very good. Not right now. First, you give the check, and you take. This is great. But instead of give, giving this other check, you actually start with the move knight e5. And of course, now black can't play bishop e7. Black has to take. Here, black actually has to take. And now we throw in the intermezzo rook d8 check. And only now do we recapture the knight, reaching the dream scenario where black is totally paralyzed. This is what happened in the game. Giri was forced uh, to give up the exchange. And Sevian should have converted this into a win. Um, so pretty instructive illustration of the importance of move order, um, particularly when putting together a long sequence, and how complicated this stuff can be. He gave up the rook because he's paralyzed. If he doesn't, if he just sits, like if he just plays a random move, then white is going to start going after the bishop. Um, knight e2, knight f4, knight g6 is very, very hard to stop. The knight has so many entry points into black's position that black is unable to untangle in time. And black can't play g5 because, well, the rook drops. There's just too many avenues to keep to keep track of. So bishop d6 was a good practical decision, but it should not have helped in the end. But yeah, Sevian flagged. Sevian flagged in this position with the, with the white pieces. He was, I mean, I, already I think it's a draw, but he wasn't able to make this move in time. Um, okay, so we go back to, he lost on time. That's what flagging means. And I think maybe we can do one more exercise. All right, that was a bit of a detour, but hopefully it illustrates the, kind of demystifies the concept of move order. Okay, on we go. Number eight. Okay. Well, this is made very easy by the fact that we're down a queen, which immediately tells you that there's probably some sort of forced mating sequence. And this is pure pattern, pure pattern recognition here. Bishop takes a2 is begging to be played. It's the only logical move. King takes a2. And now you just have to know the idea. Here you can see very clearly what pattern recognition does for you in chess. If you aren't aware of the mating pattern, you're probably going to think it's rook a8, king b1, and then rook a1. But if you keep calculating, you'll see that white just escapes to c2, and black loses. Of course, you can make a queen in that position, but white's just going to take the queen. White is up a 1,000 pieces. After rook a8, king b1, rook a1, king c2, if you take the rook, that's too slow. White can simply take black's rook. So you need to cover the b1 square. You need to fill that square so that rook a8 is a, back, is a ladder mate. And you do it by promoting. You make a queen, forcing the rook to step onto the king's only retreating square, and now this is actually a ladder mate. Okay, very easy exercise. I think this was this was pretty overrated. I guess we got time for one more. Okay, white to play. All right. Yeah, good pattern to know if you weren't aware of it. It's definitely a good, good one to kind of put into your mental database of ideas. Yeah, I don't think you could make a bishop there because the king could step away. I, I'm not sure. Um, no, you actually could not make a bishop because because white could go king a3 and attack the rook. Yeah, no, you had to make a queen. Okay, so 
we're two pieces down here, but clearly we have a very impressive array of pieces attacking Black's King from various uh, from various positions. Oh, it seems like Queen takes G6 has to be the move that we start with. Queen takes G6 check. What happens? Well, King H8 is easy. We made it with Rook H5. Great. Queen takes G6. The problem seems to be Queen to G7 because we're still we are still down a piece after Queen to G7, and in that position we might be at a dead end because if Bishop takes C6 check, then simply Bishop takes C6. That doesn't seem to lead anywhere. One interesting idea after queen takes g6, queen g7 is to play rook takes e6, trying to set up some sort of a discovery against the king. And the ultimate idea is to force the king onto h8, because there it will be checkmated with rook h5. So after queen takes g6, queen g7, rook takes e6, if bishop takes e6, then we recapture with a check, and then we checkmate the king on h on h5. But after rook takes e6, obviously the queen is hanging. Queen takes queen, rook e takes f6 check, king h7. And even though we can recapture the queen, we're going to lose the rook on f5. I'll put this line on the board once we solve it. Oh, immediately, this tells me that a move order issue might solve the problem, because this comes very, very close to working. The problem is that the queen on g6 is hanging. So the logical question is, well, what if we start with rook takes e6? That eliminates the problem of the hanging queen. In that situation, it seems like black has to take the rook with the bishop. Otherwise, the discovery is going to be totally devastating. We're going to take the bishop with check, and we're going to win everything. And after bishop takes e6, now we play queen takes g6 check. Nothing changes. If black blocks with the bishop, we have bishop takes e6. Same if queen g7. And if king h8, we still have the ladder mate with rook h5. So here, whole board awareness is very important, as well as, again, resisting the temptation to play a super, super tempting first move. Again, it's very easy when I tell you where to pause and think, but if you're solving this on your own, you might be very tempted to play queen takes g6 and then start thinking. And also not necessarily to pay attention to the role played by the bishop and instead to hyper-focus on these two pieces. So we play rook e6. Okay, king g7 is not a move that I considered. Well, I'm assuming that we should just take the queen, but let's take a second here. Maybe this is some sort of a trick question. Because black does have a lot of extra pieces. We shouldn't forget that. Rook e7, bishop e7. No, but we're completely winning there. We've got two pawns on the king side. Yeah, rook e7, bishop e7. And I guess we have to find an accurate move here. Or maybe just rook takes f8. Yeah, I don't see another move. I think we should just take the rook. Okay, and the puzzle is solved. I guess after bishop takes f8, we can just give queen c7 check, or we can drive the h pawn up to h5, uh, exploiting the undefended knight. It's just a winning position. Okay, we've done nine. I think it's worth doing one last one to make it 10. Okay, last one. Okay, so white to play. What's going on here? Well, there are, we have a bunch of pieces for black's queen. In fact, we have two rooks and a bishop for black's queen, but black is attacking us with everything that they've got. This seems to be a defensive exercise, at least at first blush. This seems to be an exercise in curbing your enthusiasm, curbing black's attacking prowess. So what is black actually threatening here? Well, black is threatening a few things. Black is threatening perpetual check with queen g3, queen h3. And that already rules out a lot of options. Like if you play f takes g4, then at a minimum, black has perpetual check. So is there a way to stop queen g3? Well, there is no physical way to stop queen g3, but we can try to take the sting out of it by involving the rook defensively. Rook a2 is a very valuable resource to remember because the rooks are very good at defending laterally, intending to block the check with rook g2. I don't think that there's another move here other than rook a2. I think this is essentially forced. Rook a2, what if black plays g takes f3, for instance? Well, then maybe we can drag the rook into h2, surrounding the king with as many defensive pieces as possible, and I think the attack fizzles out there after queen g3, king h1. The problem with going rook to f2, I think, is that... Well, what is the problem with rook f2? Well, one of the issues is that after g takes f3, if you play rook h2 in that position, it's just not as effective of a defensive construction because the other rook just isn't doing anything. Also, rook f2 allows g3 with tempo. Why would you allow that move with tempo? I think rook a2 just makes more logical sense. Let's go for it. Rook a2, g takes f3. Again, black threatens perpetual check with queen g3, queen h3. 
This time, because the rook on f1 is going to hang. So we have to proactively get our rook to h2 so that there is no check down the h file. Bang, bang, and black is out of attacking ideas. And the bishop is going to get involved because we're going to go d6 on the next move, get the bishop back, and we're just going to have an overwhelming amount of material for the queen. Uh, so defensive exercise, process of elimination, very effective here. And um, yeah, and, and basically, that's basically it. Okay, that was 10 exercises. As you can see, they weren't all terribly complicated, even if the ratings seem very high. Some of them were pretty much straightforward. Others were more complicated. Um, applying basic tactical skills, basic calculation skills, also is very pertinent at this level, as you could see, like considering checks and captures, process of elimination, comparison, comparing two similar looking moves and assessing uh, the pros and cons of each, and obviously attention to detail and avoiding assumptions, very, very important. And a lot of the positions, the key was not to assume that a particular move was forced uh, and not to play the tempting move at the start of the puzzle, uh, but instead to pause and, and to make sure that you're considering all of the options. But hopefully you, you took something away from this, even if you're a newer player. I know that there were a lot of lines I was saying in my head, but there's no way to avoid that. Um, and you can always have a board next to you where you translate the moves as I'm saying them if you don't feel comfortable uh, with all the visualization that you have to do. All right. Well, for people watching on YouTube, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, thanks so much for watching. And I'll try to be a little bit more regular in my uploads uh, from, from here on out. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for watching.